Hello everyone, it's been a little while since uh, <laughs> Luke has shown up and made a cameo here on our videos, but this is part three video for um, inductive reasoning, inductive arguments. Hey bud, um, I'm going to try to make this video happen, but he is so squirrely, and there, well it's just around, I'll be okay. Um, tonight, um, the video lecture, this part three video, is all about um, causal reasoning. So we're going to focus on causal reasoning tonight. And it's kind of a little um, interlude almost between the other forms of inductive reasoning that, we're, that we've been learning about. So we've learned about statistical generalizations and applications. And each one of those had their own kind of special set of criteria that was really kind of informal for how to uh, evaluate them, different set of criteria for each. And that's going to happen basically the same kind of format when we talk about um, argument from analogy and inference of best explanation. But causal reasoning kind of fits in a weird in-between area here because in some ways this might seem familiar to, from the formal logic section. Um, and in fact, I'm going to use some of the principles that we learned from formal deductive logic to help us with understanding causal inferences. Um, but it still is inductive reasoning. This is, this is still going to be inductive reasoning. So. Uh, I like to kind of describe this section as kind of like a little a little game, um, kind of like a, a, it's actually kind of a pretty interesting little game. It's kind of like pretending that you're a scientist. It's really not, I mean, scientific reasoning can get very complicated, but in terms of um, some of the structural elements to it, it can be fairly sim simple. Um, there are, there's a bunch of different types of scientific reasoning out there, of course, uh, different types of models. Um, inference of the best explanation is for instance, another model that we use in science um, that is not one that is maybe as commonly known. But this, the kinds of stuff we're going to learn here in this unit, um, this from the material in Chapter 9 from Understanding Arguments, um, is maybe a little closer to what you might expect as uh, how science proceeds in trying to gain knowledge about the world, and how scientific evidence functions rationally. Uh, in terms of justifying a conclusion. So this might be a little more familiar. Um, in some ways, I feel like doing problems from this section is kind of like doing a um, uh, running running a, a science fair project back from like middle school or something. It's, it's not all that dissimilar from that. Um, but let's, uh, let's uh, enough of me just kind of droning on and on about this. Here's the game plan. Or let me, here's the kind of setup for this. So, um, many of the arguments that we use on an everyday basis when we treat something as evidence for something else depends on causal knowledge. It requires us to know things about um, how the world is sort of causally set up. I always like to use this image of um, uh, the Matrix. You remember at the end of the first, maybe the Matrix is starting to get to be an older reference, but at the end of the first movie, Neo like sees the code of the computer simulated reality that he's in well, that's kind of like what we're trying to get at when we're understanding causal laws of the universe. We're like, what's the underlying code that everything plays by? What are the rules that everything plays by? Um, that's what we're trying to figure out. And whenever I use one piece of evidence, one like an observation that I make, like I see that, and that that's a sign that something is the case. So I, I, t I take that observation as evidence for something else. That only works because I'm counting on certain... Um, other causal laws that are like making a connection between those things. Um, one of the most famous philosophers to touch on this subject is a philosopher named David Hume who put together a really famous argument, kind of a negative argument, a skeptical argument called the problem of induction. Um, and if you're curious about this, I, I, I recommend either talking to me or looking it up on the internet or finding out about it. Problem of induction is very fascinating. And, and it can be actually a little easily misunderstood. So if you want to if you take a look at it, like you watch a YouTube video or something, maybe um, that's not this. That's not this. Another YouTube video. Um, then maybe check in with me and talk to me about it if you want to hear more about it. But in the problem of induction, which is still a kind of controversial, unsolved philosophical. Oh, buddy. Oh, you okay? You all right? Okay. Um, the problem of induction, which is still kind of unsolved to this day, at least it's controversial, controversial whether a solution has been find, found that is adequate to the problem of induction. But as a part of this, David Hume is remarking about how um, we don't observe uh, 
causal laws directly, but they're sort of the basis of all of our other reasoning about what he calls matters of fact. So if you know anything, any knowledge about the facts of like the states of affairs that the world are in, like do you have how many coins do you have in your pocket, or who is president of the United States, or whatever, you're going to be using um, some sort of causal reasoning as a part of that. Um, here's a simple example um, that uh, that I usually bring up when I when I'm doing a lecture on the problem of induction. Um, let's say I you get a postcard in the mail from me. It has my name printed on it. And I'm like, hey, what's up? How do you think about our philosophy class? Can you believe I'm in France? And you see a postmark that says France, like stamped on it. Um, so you get that postcard in the mail. Uh, what would you believe? You'd conclude that I'd been in France. And your belief for this is that there's no other way that postcard would have gotten the things on there that there could have. And actually, if you think about it a little carefully, of course that there are other ways that could happen. Maybe I've got some fake Paris post stamps that I, um, you know, stamped it with and then just snuck around and put it in your mailbox or something. I mean, that's possible. It's not plausible or likely. And that's where this becomes an exercise in inductive reasoning, um, that there's not a sort of guarantee here or all the possibilities have been covered. But still, your belief that the postmark is evidence that I was in France has to do with what would have caused the post stamp to happen. Your knowledge about the causal parameters of those post stamps and how they how they occur is what lets you make that inference. One example that David Hume uses in his writing is, let's say you're on a uh, desert island and in the middle of the island you find a pocket watch and because students are always clever and they challenge me in various ways I've changed the case so it's like you find the pocket watch inside a chest that has been buried underneath the, like next to a tree with a sign sticking out. So this isn't something that could have accidentally happened. Um, the, all those details are in there to prevent that. You are getting a little squirrely, but this may not work. We'll see. We'll see how much longer I can make this happen. So you find the pocket watch on the desert island. What will you conclude? There must have been a human on this island before. Why? Because you know how pocket watches come to exist, that only humans are making pocket watches. Dolphins aren't doing it, crabs aren't doing it, they don't grow on trees. Um, because it was in the, you know, the uh, box that was buried, it couldn't have fallen from a plane or something like that. So it's because of all your understanding of the causal parameters of how this world works, that is what makes you conclude that existence of pocket watch means there were people present. So if that's how all arguments work, if we're reasoning any time, oh, I'm sorry, but I'm getting a little too excited here. Um, if any time we're using any observation as evidence for some other state of affair existing in the world, then that means that there's some causal reasoning going on. Well, how do, how do I know those causal rules? Where do I get that knowledge from? And presumably that also comes from experience, and that's what David Hume says as well. I don't directly observe the laws of nature, but I do get to infer them as patterns based on uh, other observations that I make. So um, David Hume famously says, what are you, you're like growling, are you okay? It's so spacey right now, it's way past his bedtime, but he won't fall asleep. Are you going to be cool? Are you going to be cool? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, where was I? Oh yes. So, oh no, I just lost it again. Uh, oh right, right, right. So another example David Hume uses is he says, you know, imagine Adam in the Garden of Eden. Even if you don't believe in the Bible, I mean, just imagine someone who is just created and plopped down in this world. Uh, if that had happened, no one could tell from the translucency and liquidity of water that it has the power to drown him or from the, these are like almost direct quotes from him or from the uh, the warmth and brilliance of fire that it could consume him he doesn't you don't see the causal powers of things uh, directly you don't observe those directly but what we do is we have repeated experiences and we're like huh I think there's a pattern here there must be some causal rule that explains that regularity in my observation. So that part of the process, where do we under where do what are the arguments 
that we use as evidence for justifying us believing that a certain causal power or causal relationship exists, where does that come from? How does that happen? And uh, it is going to depend on experience and like running many experiments, um, but there's going to be a way that we look for patterns or which patterns are the ones that are significant. And that's what this material is mostly going to cover. So I'm going to do some more drawing here and we'll use a case example to talk about it. And we're going to take a little break here. So I'll be right back with you. So I'm sorry for all the uh, baby disruption. That probably was a little distracting. So just to kind of do a quick little review here, I'm going to draw it out in kind of standard form. Um, so if I have a conclusion here, it might be something like, so the conclusion is going to be um, some um, prediction or um, or perhaps a some some claim I, let's put it like this some claim um, about so our, let's just call it some factual claim okay so this is about the states of affairs in the world Um, that's what uh, causal arguments, that's what, I mean, that's what empirical knowledge of the world is about. It's some factual claim about how the world works. And one of my premises is always going to be, um, oh man, I, I don't know why I used the colon, I'm sorry. Uh, one of them is always going to be some observations. So this is, this is what we traditionally think of intuitively, I think, as, as evidence. That we're always like, oh, I think that this thing is true. Why? Because here's my evidence. Boom, right? Um, and and that and we usually consider that as settling it right there. But we need to think a little more carefully about stuff because that evidence, all on its own, is usually not sufficient to be able to um, give us even a good reason for the conclusion being true. It's not unless some causal law is also true. Um, that this ob that we could have some reason for connecting the observations uh, with this fact that is being claimed in the conclusion. Um, in other words, if um, my conclusion is that there is a fire over there, and my reason for thinking this is I see smoke over there, um, this only works as an argument. Um, this only works as an argument if uh, fire causes smoke, <laughs> right? There has to be some causal law that connects this observation, which is another fact, right? It's another state of affairs. It's just one, the one that's being observed with something that is not observed, the factual claim that's in the conclusion. So um, this is a really rudimentary way of, of putting it together. But... Um, this is this is part of Hume's claim, and it seems like a pretty decent claim um, on the face of it until we start breaking our philosophy caps out a little bit more here. But on the face of it, it seems like every single claim that we make about the world, if we're going to have some argument for it, if we're going to have some evidence for believing that it's true, that depends on having some causal knowledge. We have to know these causal laws. So the next question is, where do we get the knowledge for those things? So if I want to create an argument that ends with a causal law, ugh, <laughs> oh, it's late for me too. If I want an argument um, that's going to have a causal law as a conclusion, you know, what does the argument look like? Man, I keep doing this. What's my evidence for thinking that there is a causal law that happens? Well, there's going to definitely need to be some observations, like I was saying before. We're going to, in order to know that there's a causal law. This is like a generalization, but I'm going to look through this observational evidence in a very particular way. So just because I ran a bunch of experiments, that doesn't necessarily tell me what causal laws I can conclude. Maybe you've heard correlation is not causation. Um, and, I mean, that's even going to be true even with this the kind of reasoning we're going to be doing here. But there are some parameters for what we're looking for when we're talking about causes. Um, I'm going to use an example here in a second. Uh, I, I just want to give it to you now so I can kind of foreshadow it um, before I do some more preliminary stuff here. But uh, the example I'm going to do is like, let's say I'm, I'm a, a gardener. I'm not a gardener, so this is a perfect example. I'm a gardener who doesn't know how to garden. 
uh, and I don't know how to get my plants to grow. I want to um, grow some plants, but I don't know what I need to do to make that happen. Um, I want to know what are the causal conditions for my plants thriving. Well, what I might do is try to be a scientist about this and do a bunch of experiments. I'm going to try out a bunch of different things, and then I'm going to see what happens. And then from that, I'm going to conclude, uh, I'm going to make some causal conclusions. But that process is actually a little more structured than it may seem. I, I mean, I think we're doing these sorts of pseudoscientific experiments constantly. I mean, I, I got this baby. I, even my baby is, like, doing this. He's, like, barely three months old. You can see him trying out different things and seeing what happens and then learning from that. Well, what's really going on there? And specifically, if we draw lessons that we're entitled to draw, that is, we're justified in drawing those conclusions, what does that look like? What are the standards of accountability here? Is it just anything that I speculate on based on my uh, experience and observations? No. There's actually some very particular rules here for um, how we can test sort of causal claims. Okay, so uh, I'm going to use that kind of gardening example uh, as a toy example for later on. But, but back to kind of some abstract theoretical stuff. Here's, a, here's an important point. When we're talking about um, causality, when we're talking about causes and effects, um, what we're actually talking about is a little bit of a mystery. Um, there's a whole field in philosophy called philosophy of science, which is entirely devoted to trying to give a philosophical um, explanation or analysis or theory about uh, what is actually going on with what scientists are up to. Um, and you, it might be sort of strange to think that scientists don't know what science is all about. Um, if anyone knew what it was, you think it would be them. Uh, but there's actually a good reason to think that maybe scientists uh, are not actually in the business of knowing what they're doing. Um, that, don't take that the wrong way, but <laughs> here's what I mean by this. Understanding metaphysical questions and issues of knowledge is not actually what science is disposed to do. That's not its subject matter. Its subject matter is studying the empirical world. It's not asking metaphysical questions about essences the way that philosophy does. If you want to hear more about this, I'd be happy to talk more about this. But um, scientists are not themselves usually in the business of giving philosophical explanations of what they're up to. That's not what they're trained in, and it's not what they're focusing on in their research and inquiry. In fact, I've talked to many scientists personally who are like, yeah, that's not, I don't do that. I ask them like, uh, I'm in, so my, my field of science that I, I've got the most contact with is cognitive science, which is an interdisciplinary field that has philosophers and psychologists and scientists kind of all working together to try to understand the mind because that is an interdisciplinary subject. Um, and I've met many scientists who have been like, uh, I asked them like, what do you think about these philosophical questions about the mind based on the kind of neuroscience that you're doing or something like that? And some of them like to put on the philosophy cap and play around with that. But many of them are like, even if they do play around, they're like, this isn't what I do. Um, you're asking me to basically speculate on something I have no expertise in. Now, if you want to ask me about, you know, mechanisms and neurons, I can do that. I can talk about that for days. But what does this mean about consciousness or free will or anything like that? Or even like, what is the content of thought itself? What's the structure of thought? How does cognition function? Those are questions that they don't have any answers to. And they, those are philosophical questions. And, and, um, and if they do give answers, these are usually answers that are not quite um, as um, robust as those that are focusing on this as their main uh, field of, of study. So there, there's a little bit of division of labor here that goes on with knowledge, and not all um, knowledge that we pursue, not all truth that we pursue is pursuable in the same way. Um, experimentation, empirical experimentation, is necessary when we're trying to understand the world, and that's why science makes a, such a big deal out of observational evidence. There are other questions that don't uh, depend on observation at all, or that it arguably do not, or at least it's controversial whether they do or not, and that's a philosophical question. So there's this whole area of philosophy called philosophy of science, which deals with philosophical questions that are related to uh, how science works. And one of the things that science is always playing around with is the concept of a cause. But what exactly is a cause? Well, that's not so easy to define. And in fact, a lot of different scientists, when you ask them to define it, define it in wildly different ways. 
Um, actually, just uh, this is kind of timely. Just in the last um, oh, four months or something, sometime in there, I ran across an article that was by a philosopher of science who did a study. They did some research into uh, science textbooks from various fields. Uh, you, I think he looked at over 70 textbooks or something like that. Um, I don't think it was quite over 100. But um, looking at how these different science textbooks describe really basic concepts about how science works and uh, to undergraduates. So this is all college level courses in psychology, chemistry, physics, you know, the whole gamut, all the different sciences. Uh, lots of different answers. Even within the same discipline you get different answers. Um, sometimes conflicting answers, sometimes answers that are easily disproven. <laughs> I mean it was all over the place. Uh, if you want that paper I'd forward it along to you too. It's a fascinating read. It might be a little disturbing, um, but it also might open up your eyes to how uh, philosophy of science is a real thing um, and definitely there is need for it. So this is one of the topics. Uh, what are causes? And there's a lot that's controversial about them so there's a lot that people disagree. But there's one thing that everyone agrees is a part of the foundations of all cause, causal, uh, causal laws. So there's a lot of other things. I'm going to draw it like this. There's a lot of other things, you know, question marks all over the place here about what else might go into something being a cause. Even the textbook sort of speculates about some of these things um, that we, some of the other factors uh, that go into the concept of calling something a cause or calling it an effect. But there's a kind of a core, um, and that's the conditional, which is something we learned about from logic. It's got this kind of if something, then something else sort of structure to it. Um, it's a hypothetical claim. That's what conditionals are. And those are always at the heart of all causal laws. Um, the kind of language we're going to focus on is this kind of language. P is sufficient for Q or P is necessary for Q. So we talked before when we were doing uh, translations for conditionals, we talked about this language of uh, sufficient necessary conditions. Maybe you remember the sun principle for remembering how to translate that with the horseshoe. This is what we're going to be focusing on. How do we know whether something is sufficient or necessary for something else? Is a sufficient condition or a necessary condition for something else? When I'm trying to figure out what makes my plants grow, I'm interested in, you know, I've got what are, I'm going to call these things different things actually. So we're going to, I'm going to, I'll use the language I'm going to use later. I'm going to ask, what is a candidate feature um, that is sufficient for some target feature? And I'm going to want to know um, the same thing with respect to which candidate features um, are necessary for a target feature. So if uh, the target in the example I'm going to use in a second here is going to be um, the plants grow. So when I'm trying to figure out what causes my plants to thrive, what makes them grow, the target condition here is the plants growing, and I want to know what's sufficient for that and what's necessary for that. So if I'm asking for what's sufficient, I'm asking what is it that as long as that's happening, the plants are going to grow? Now, If I'm looking for causal powers here, knowing what are the sufficient conditions that would make my plants grow, what, what as long as that's happening, the plants are definitely growing, that'd be useful to know. It'd also be useful to know if I'm trying to understand the causal conditions surrounding my plants thriving knowing what candidate conditions would be necessary for the plants to grow would also be important. So I, I'm trying to kind of connect these formal concepts here of what we're looking for when we're doing this causal reasoning and doing tests for this causal reasoning um, with a kind of intuitive case um, of uh, me trying to experiment with doing different things in my garden and figuring out what gets my plants to grow. So let's, let's draw some more here. Let's say I run a bunch of these experiments. So I've got I've got a bunch of different um, plots laid out. So I've got uh, these, like in the book, talks about different cases, like case one. I'm going to call them uh, different uh, beds. So I've got garden beds, garden bed number one, and then actually let's let me speed this up a little bit. Whoop. And I don't know, we could do as many. I, this is just a, a made up example. I'm just making this up on the spot. But 
uh, it'll serve our purposes. So I got five different garden beds here that I'm working on and oh, I can make a, some nice lines here. Let's do that. So I've, uh, you know, like a good little scientist, I'm running a bunch of different variations on my experiment trying to isolate what are the factors that are responsible for my plants growing and I can't do that with just one case. I mean, one case is not going to be enough uh, to really get a good idea of what's happening. I don't, you know, in any single case, there could be all sorts of things of why something worked or didn't work. Um, it might just be an accident. It might just be a statistical anomaly. Um, so the one feature we're definitely going to be tracking as I'm like doing these gardens in different ways and then keeping records here, I'm going to be definitely looking, do the plants grow or not? Did they grow? So maybe in some cases they do. Uh, yeah, they grew there. Here, no, they didn't. No, they didn't grow here. And yes, they grew here. And uh, no, they didn't grow there. Okay. And then we're going to have some other candidate conditions. So there's always going to be a target condition. There's also going to be candidate conditions um, and there's going to be multiple ones usually so let's put it like that candidate conditions and I don't know let's what are some things that make plants grow let's see whether I water them or not um, maybe if I use fertilizer um, sunlight and uh, let's see if I sing to them uh, and another silly one. Let's let's see. Like put skittles in there. Maybe they go. Yeah, I put skittles in them. So you know this is totally shaping up like a child uh, <laughs> science fair project. Put skittles in there. Let's see what happens. Okay. So here are the candidates we've got. So I'm gonna make a, a little chart here to keep track. Of, like a good scientist, I'm keeping track of everything. Did I water them? Um, fertilizer. Did we do that? sunlight um, and singing to them and then skittles alright let's see if this will all fit in our chart yay great okay. and let me make some more lines just to make it pretty alright put some more lines in here alright there we go and you know, I'm just making this stuff up right now, so this isn't a part of the problem. I'm just setting things up. Um, th but you would you'd record what happened. The the big question for us is going to be how do we reason about this? What are we going to um, do with a data plot once we've got it? Just having the data is not enough to prove whether something is a sufficient or necessary condition for something else, or if something causes something else. We are notorious about jumping to conclusions about what the data suggests by reasoning with statistics inappropriately. And so that's what this is what this is all going to be about. I mean, when you if you read the book, you remember the book was talking a lot about the SCT and the NCT, the sufficient condition test and the necessary condition test. And that's really what we're here to learn. From if I got a data plot and I'm going to fill this in in a second, but when I got a bunch of data, how can how would I look at that data to figure out whether the data shows me that there's evidence for thinking that something is sufficient for something else like a candidate is maybe water is sufficient to getting the plants grow or with, and or whether something is a necessary condition is singing to the plants necessary for them growing you know, I don't know. so we have to be able to know how to look at the data not just collect it but how to look at it and there is some there's some um, rational standards about how I even set up these experiments before you know when I'm designing which cases I'm actually going to attempt we'll talk about that too a little bit later um, I'm gonna pause the video here and just fill these things in and I'm just gonna do it like sort of randomly I'm like okay so I um, I watered uh, let's see I didn't I didn't water these ones these first two I don't know I'm just kinda doing this randomly Yes. So I'm, I'm just going to be filling these things. I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to just fill them in so you don't have to watch me do this. But 
I'm not doing this with any plan in particular. I'm just throwing some patterns together, so this may not reflect reality at all. But it'll still be fine as giving us something to work with. So um, I'm going to fill this in, and then I'll be back. All right, there we are. So I just kind of put these together, and and we'll uh, see what sense we make of this. Um, so actually, um, I'm going to go away from the screen for a second because we need to define how this SCT NCT stuff works out. So what are, how do we actually look for this? Um, but maybe we can actually do a little of this intuitively first. So um, I'm going I'm to give you a, a more um, mechanical procedure that I think will make it ultimately easier and there, there's, this is the technique that I want you to learn. Um, but if we're just trying to get an idea of this uh, intuitively, um, I think I want to connect you with that first before I give you a procedure that's a little more technical and analytical. So let's say I'm trying to figure out um, uh, I'm trying to figure out a test here. Let's say I'm, I'm going to pick out a particular candidate um, and I'm going to test this claim. Let's say I make a hypothesis, right? This is like a science fair. I make a hypothesis. Uh, water is necessary for the plants to grow. All right, so that's a claim, that's a hypothesis that I make. And I want to see if the evidence supports this. Well, um, if we're saying the water is necessary for the plants to grow, then we're saying the plants can't grow without water. So let's see if the data supports that. Is it possible for the plants to grow without the water? <gasps> oh, uh oh, yeah, garden bed number one. The plants grew, but I didn't water them in, in garden bed number one. Uh. So maybe water is not necessary for the plants to grow. And that's basically how we're going to run these tests. We're going to look for counterexamples. We're going to make a hypothesis and then see if the evidence contradicts it. So water is necessary for the plants to grow actually got contradicted by our data. And that's probably because I just made it up. <laughs> this doesn't actually reflect real life. Um, but if that had happened, then you'd be like, oh, okay, I guess water is not necessary for the plants to grow. Let's say... I was trying to figure out that instead of um, water being necessary, let's say I wanted to figure out if water was uh, sufficient. Ugh. Ah, sufficient. Yeah, I cannot spell tonight. Sorry. Uh, water is sufficient for the plants to grow. Let's say that's the claim I want to test now. And if I'm saying water is sufficient for the plants to grow, then I'm basically saying that all it takes for the plants to grow is water. So this claim would be contradicted by any case in which I watered the plants, but they didn't grow. Because saying water is sufficient for the plants to grow is saying you water them, they're going to grow. It's going to happen. So if you ever water them and they don't grow, that would disprove this hypothesis. And does that happen? Yes, we've got counterexamples here in, in garden bed number three and number five. In both cases, we watered the plants, but they didn't grow. So that disproves this statement too. So that's basically informally, hopefully that connects with your in intuition that you're like, yep, that w the evidence that we've got here, you know, spelled doom for both of these hypotheses, that water is neither sufficient nor necessary for the plants to grow, given the data that we've got. Hopefully that makes some intuitive sense, but if it doesn't, don't worry about it because we're about to break it down in a much more technical and accurate sort of way. So I'm actually gonna bring up a new screen. All right, so we're back here with, uh, and I'm going to go kind of fresh here. So I'm actually going to um, do, let's see, let's do, oh, I don't know if I could easily do that. Okay, let's just make a line like this. Here's a simple line. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to make it a thin line. That's fine. Um, and over here, I'm going to give you notes for how to handle the SCT. And down here, I'm going to give you notes for how to handle the NCT. And I'm going to use all the language I was using before, like candidate conditions and target conditions. Um, if, we're, if we're testing for things being sufficient conditions for something else or necessary conditions for something else, I encourage you to think about this as like testing a hypothesis. So a claim that says, um, uh, I'm going to do this like this, candidate um, is sufficient for target okay so um, 
this is like a model of a kind of claim that you could make. To say a candidate is sufficient for a target, or alternatively, um, that a candidate feature um, is necessary for some target feature. Okay. So when we're doing the SCT and the NCT, it's like we're testing a claim. There's like a claim that's being made, and we want to see. Does the evidence support this claim? This is these sorts of claims, something being sufficient or necessary. Remember, that's like the core of what a causal claim is. So when we're designing a causal law, it's going to at least have this logical uh, claim at its core. And there might be some other things that we tack onto that concept, but this is always going to be the core. This is sort of the minimal thing we'd have to do to make a claim about causal laws. What are the rules for how reality works? Right? What are what are the sufficient and necessary conditions for things? That's what we want to find. So to test this, it's going to be a lot like testing validity. You remember, um, here, I'm going to bring this up. remember back when we were doing validity, um, we were looking for a counterexample. Even when we were using truth tables or we were using our imagination, either way, we were like, can I prove that the argument is in fact not valid? That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a counterexample case, like a case where all the premises are true and the conclusion false at the same time. That means that the premises, the truth of the premises does not provide a total guarantee for the truth of the conclusion. So that's what I was looking for. I was, if I could disprove it, then I would say it was invalid. And only if I failed to disprove it would I say it actually was valid. Now, this is a little different than formal logic because in formal logic and testing arguments for validity, we were able to like try to figure out every possibility. We could look under every tree behind it, every nook and cranny, you know, every we could look everywhere to try to figure out if there was a counterexample. That's not going to be possible this time because we can't run experiments for every possible state of affairs that could happen. Like if I wanted to capture all the different conditions for how I could set up my garden, there's no way I can control for all the variables that are logically possible. So I'm just going to be doing some of them, but I don't need to test for all of them. Um, it depends on what I'm looking to actually understand. So um, the data that I need to collect depends on the kind of claim that I'm making. So that's why I'm, I'm reconnecting it here with, you know, let's keep track of what's the claim that we're testing. We're going to try to disprove it. And only if we can't disprove it are we going to say it passes the test, good job, that kind of thing. Here's another thing that's a little different here with the SCT and NCT. It's an important sort of theoretical note. If I'm able to come up with a counterexample that shows that something fails the SCT or the NCT, then I know it definitely is not a sufficient condition or a necessary condition for something else. It only takes one counterexample, one failed case, in order to, to have it fail the test and then fail as a claim for, for being a sufficient or necessary condition for something else. I mean, all it takes is one failure. If it passes, though, we still don't know if it really is sufficient or necessary. It might just be that we didn't run the right experiment, and a counterexample will happen later, you know, and under some case that we didn't take a look at. And this happens to scientists constantly. This is part of the progress of science, and why maybe you, you know, like, as science progresses, it kind of rethinks and is critical of what happened in the past. And that's because, you know, we, we're looking for patterns, and a hypothesis looks like it's holding true, and then, oh, all of a sudden we find a counterexample. And then we're like, well, I guess the world doesn't really work that way. Not ultimately. Or it's more complicated. Or there's some deeper rules going on here, right? But we have to, again, kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out what is the real law then, um, because that previous law was disproven. So this is a part of how science works. It's normal. It's ordinary. Um, and that is making progress. Uh, we're, we're narrowing our understanding, uh, we're increasing the fidelity of our understanding of the causal framework of reality. So uh, that's what I'm actually going to be teaching you here at the SCT and NCT. So how do we do it? What does a counterexample to these claims look like? Well, here's how I want you to think about it. It's gonna, this is going to be a cool moment in which we like connect a bunch of dots from a bunch of material from the class. I, I don't know. Are you excited? Because I'm excited. <laughs> All right, it's fun. Okay, so um, think about this claim candidate is sufficient for a target. We can turn this into a kind of logical statement. And we can do the same thing with uh, necessary claims too. Um, these are conditionals. And remember we've got this nice 
um, sun principle here. I'm actually going to put that up because this is for both of them. Um, don't forget sun. Sun, very useful here for both. Uh, I want to... Eh, eh, eh. This is important for both of them. Both the SCT and the S and the NCT. We can use the Sun principle to figure this out. So remember, if we're saying candidate is sufficient for target, the candidate saying is a sufficient condition, it's going to go on the sufficient condition side. So we're going to actually put um, the candidate on this side of the horseshoe, and then on the other side, we'll put the target. Now, when we're saying the candidate is necessary for the target then the candidate is going to go in the necessary condition spot, which means um, the target is going first here. And the candidate is on the other side to get it to, to go right with, with the sun principle. That's how we would do it. So now we've, we've used our knowledge of how to translate conditionals to get it into a conditional. Well, here's the next question. How do you know that these statements, uh, when we're testing them, the truth table for a conditional, under what conditions would a conditional, woo, that's all I wanted, under what conditions would a conditional be false? When are these things going to be false? If you know your truth tables for conditionals, uh, if you can remember that too, then you know there's only one false case. There's only one way conditionals can be false, and that's when the first part is true. So we'll do that for both. And the second part is false. So if, if, you're, if you're remembering your, how to translate conditionals um, into the logical symbol language using the sun principle, and you can remember the truth table for conditionals, which arguably, I mean, hopefully, you should be able to do this from the logic section, then you can always tell what is it that you need as a uh, when you're looking for a counterexample because and actually here let's use this thing that eh, would be snazzy this right here oh that looks terrible <laughs> yeah let's do it maybe I can make it look good so this right here uh, that and this right here these are your counterexamples. <laughs> Counterexample. Okay, and down here. Counterexample. Um, so I'm going to draw a little arrow. That's the case. And, and it's easy to, the, the reason I like to teach this method as opposed to the way the book does it or the way that we did it informally was that requires you to just like memorize a counterexample case um, and it's it's so easy to like flip these two in your brain especially if you're working on the exam or something um, but you can always recover the answer I guess this is maybe well it's less important for my online students because you don't have to take the exam and uh, you get to take a kind of open book um, but, you know, if you want to carry this knowledge with you into the real world where you're not going to carry your critical reasoning textbook along with you wherever you go, I don't know, maybe you want to do that, but let's say you didn't. <laughs> you want to be able to remember how to uh, test evidence or uh, data that you collect to figure out whether that data is evidence for something, um, if it suggests that something is a uh, target uh, or I'm sorry, is a candidate um, sufficient or necessary condition for some target, this would be how you would do it. So the SCT is all about testing a claim, testing a particular candidate for a particular target to see whether it holds up. And if there are any counterexample cases, then that's it for the claim. Game over. Okay? So let's keep this in mind here and pull up, um, pull up our last thing. So we had our, our garden bed example here, okay? So again, um, let's let's go through these each one by one. So so we've got you know a bunch of different candidate feature here. We got five different candidates to test for this one target feature, the plants growing, and that's usually how it's going to go. I mean, the target is set, 
it's the candidates that you're like, maybe this one, maybe this one, maybe this one. You've got all these different hypotheses to choose from. So it's kind of like we've got five different tests. Is water sufficient for target? What are the other ones? Is fertilizer sufficient for the plants to grow? So uh, target is grow. These are all the candidates. So is water sufficient for the plants to grow? Is fertilizer sufficient for the plants to grow? Is sunlight sufficient for the plants to grow? Sun singing sufficient? Skittles sufficient? That's how we're doing it. And then we're going to ask the same thing with necessary claims. Is water necessary for the plants to grow? Is fertilizer necessary? So we'll do this one by one. But this little chart here will remind you what you need to be looking for. So let's test. Let's do the SCT first. So our target is the plants growing. So we're going to be looking for a case where the plants don't grow, but a certain candidate condition is present. So if we're testing whether, um, here, let's just put it in here water is sufficient for grow for the plants growing then if there's a case where the candidate water is happening but growing is not happening then that would be a counterexample that would that would ruin it so let's take a look is that happening yes is there a plant a, a case where the water um, the wa water was given to the plants and they didn't grow yep that happens there in number three and it happens there in number five. So water is eliminated as a candidate sufficient condition for the plants growing. Which I guess, I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? It's not just water all by itself that'll make your plants grow. Um, how about fertilizer? Does fertilizer pass the SCT? Is fertilizer sufficient for the plants to grow? Is there a case where we fertilize them, but they didn't grow? Let's see. Fertilizer, yes and the plants didn't grow. So case number two is a counterexample, but that's the only one. On the exam, I'm going to be asking you to tell me um, which candidate features fail the SCT and the NCT for a certain target condition, and I'll ask you to tell me what are the counterexample cases. So if we were doing that uh, on the exam right here, if this was an exam problem, um, then we would say water fails the SCT in cases three and five. Fertilizer fails the SCT for the plants growing in uh, case number two. How about sunlight? Oh, that totally failed. So every case was a case of sunlight, but there are three cases here, two, three, and five, in which uh, they got sun, but they didn't grow. So that means sunlight is not sufficient. So sunlight fails in cases two, three, and five. How about singing? Well, now this is interesting. So again, going back to this, if we're going to get a counterexample, it has to be a case where the candidate was present, but the target was not. But we, we So we need this part of it, the candidate being present. Unfortunately, the candidate is never present here. So that means singing actually passes the SCT for the plants growing. And if that feels weird to you, that's because it is weird, and that is not the right result. Um, but here's the thing. There's something that the book calls rigorous testing. Rigorous testing. Don't forget. Don't forget. In fact, I'm going to put that in here. Don't. Don't forget. Rigorous testing. Very important. Um, basically, rigorous testing is saying if you don't have cases of the right type, then the amount of evidence, like sort of running these different candidates through the gauntlet to see what happens, won't mean anything if you're not testing the right kinds of cases. And I think this is a pretty intuitive case with the SCT. If I'm like, hmm, is singing to my plants sufficient to get them to grow? Well, if I never try it out, how could I ever have the evidence uh, to disprove it? So we'd say it's, it's not that meaningful, in other words, to say that, well, this candidate hasn't been disproven yet if it means that we haven't actually tested it. So if, if we didn't have any cases in which a candidate was present, we're not rigorously testing. Now, the other, it could also fail the other way. If we never look at cases where the plants didn't grow, then we're not rigorously testing for any of these candidates. So we need to do that as well. There need to be at least some cases where the plants uh, do not grow. And we've got that going on here. So, so we did rigorously test on that side. But when it came to singing, eh, we didn't do it there. So we did for sunlight because we looked at cases in which there was sunlight and saw what happened. So that was rigorous testing. Um, and by the way, keep, uh, you know what rigorous testing means is that there need to be some cases of this, 
and there need to be some cases of this. It's not asking that there need to be cases of both of them happening together because that's the counterexamples that may or may not happen. Okay, so um, that's not rigorous testing. But I need to have at least some cases where the candidate is present and some cases where the target is not present before I can think that I have any evidence on my hands that the, that, um, the candidate might actually be sufficient for the target. Um, let's see here. What about Skittles? Is Skittles uh, sufficient for the plants that grow? Uh, well, it doesn't look like it because here uh, we put Skittles in and they didn't grow. So Skittles. So none of these are actually sufficient. The only one that passed the SCT was singing, um, but that wasn't meaningful because we didn't rigorously test. Now, by the way, on the exam, I would want you to put that singing passes the SCT, uh, that because it does. I mean. It, Following this technical procedure, it does. Before we'd ever treat that as significant evidence, we would, you know, make sure that it was not running afoul of this whole rigorous testing thing. But um, that is, it, it still does technically pass the test. I want to make sure that you know how to functionally um, uh, conduct this analysis. I need to, I want to know that you know what are the counterexamples you're looking for. Um, so that's important. So I would want you to say that. But in the real world here, no one would take these experiments as evidence that singing will cause your plants to grow because we never actually tried it actually you know maybe it was like I'm a middle schooler so I'm like singing the plants is stupid and embarrassing and not cool so I'm not gonna do it even though I put it in as a hypothesis um, so I don't know I mean, there we go that's how the SCT works we look for cases where the candidates are present but the target is not and if that happens then we know it's not a sufficient condition um, but let's say we never got a counterexample. I don't know. Let's say Skittles was no in this case, so then it wouldn't have had a counterexample. Um, if there's no counterexample, then that means it passes the SCT. So no count. If there aren't any counterexamples, it passes the test, the sufficient condition test, and all that means is that it's still an open option. It's still a possibility for what could be a sufficient condition. It, Think of the SCT and the NCT, and, and the whole idea of rigorous testing is kind of like, I have a hypothesis, and I want to try to make it fail. I want to, you know, put it through the ringer and see if it comes out uh, with its skin intact. Um, if I try it out and there are counterexamples, well, so much for that hypothesis, right? But if, if the hypothesis survives some testing, that doesn't mean it's been proven to be true just means that we have some good evidence to think that it might be true. It hasn't failed yet, and the more that it doesn't fail, a little more convincing it is, a little more confidence we have that, hey, maybe this thing really is a sufficient condition or a necessary condition for something. Same thing happens with the NCT as it happens with the SCT. Um, I think that's important to note about this. I mean, when it comes to causal speculation, um, we are speculating, and there can be evidence, and the evidence might give us some reasons for a conclusion. But uh, there's, there's never this, like, absolute guarantee. When people talk about experiments proving something, that just <sighs> drives me up the wall sometimes because you can prove negative results, you know, with, you can, and, may, and sometimes there it even gets dicey. Um, <laughs> to talk, to talk to me about falsification sometimes. Um, but you can't, you can't positively prove these things 100%. Um, but we can, get, we can definitely start to accumulate a great body of evidence which is highly suggestive. So the fact that this is still speculative is in no way me saying like, oh yeah, scientists are just making stuff up because they aren't. They're making really good arguments and, for, and collecting a lot of really good data to help support a conclusion. But it's just not like this inescapable 100% proof. It's not like math. Even though a lot of science uses math, uh, it doesn't have the certainty that mathematical relationships do. That's just part of induction. That's how it works. It's always fallible. It's always fallible, but there still is a difference between strong inferences and weak inferences, and that's why we're holding these things accountable. Okay, so let's get back to it. We talked about SCT. Let me run this example with the NCT uh, with, our, with our, uh, our garden beds. Okay, so NCT is the same thing as SCT, except the pattern is different. Now, and, and for whatever reason, um, students find this a little less intuitive, which is another reason I like to do it mechanically, so you can kind of you don't have to rely on your intuition, which may, you know, abandon you uh, when you don't want it to. It's uh, it's contingent, 
it's fallible. Uh, but um, we've got this method to use. So if I'm testing whether something is necessary for something else, I'm looking for this counterexample now. Now I'm looking for a case where the target is present. Um, in the case of our example here, cases where the plants grow, that's our target, right? Um, and cases where the candidate is actually not present. And if that doesn't seem intuitive to you, maybe I can try to make it intuitive here by saying this. If I'm saying that, like we were talking a second ago, maybe water is necessary for the plants to grow, then I'm saying the plants don't grow without the water. So if there's ever a case of the plants growing without the water, then that directly contradicts the original claim, okay, when we're saying that it was necessary. It's not necessary if the plants can grow without it. So that's what we're looking for. Do the plants grow without the thing, you know, it's not present, false, without the thing that was claimed to be necessary for it. So let's go through this again. Um, is water necessary for the plants to grow? Requires us to ask, can the plants grow without the water? And the answer is yes. Plants are growing. No water. Case number one. All right. How about fertilizer? Can the plants grow without the fertilizer? Oh, so that passes the NCT because we never get a case where the plants are growing. Those are these two cases, one and four. We never get one of those cases where there isn't the fertilizer. The fertilizer was present in both those cases. So, so far, so good. Every time the fertilizer wasn't present, yeah, you didn't get the plants growing either. So, so far, so good. But, you know, no, mat no matter how many cases of no, no you get, it doesn't matter. Um, the only case... This and this is important. True, true cases, false, false cases. We don't care. All we care about are cases where the candidate or the the antecedent is true, and the consequent false. Antecedent true, consequent false. That's the only thing that we're really looking at. Okay. So fertilizer passed. Uh, how about sunlight? Oh, sunlight passes too. Sunlight passes the necessary condition test. But in this case, we aren't rigorously testing. The same way that singing wasn't rigorously testing for the sufficient condition, sunlight is not testing rigorously testing for the necessary condition. Because here, we've got to have some cases where the candidate isn't present. We want to see what happens without it. How do I know that sunlight is not necessary for the plants to grow? If, if, if it is necessary, I need to see what happens if I take the sunlight away. Okay, But we never did that, so we didn't rigorously test. So it passes the NCT, but trivially so. Um, and again, on the exam, all you would need to say is it passes, um, it doesn't fail, and that's it. So that'd be fine. Um, does singing is singing necessary for the plants to grow? Well, that's obviously not because uh, plants are growing without singing. In a couple cases here, one and four are both counterexamples. And then how about skittles? Are skittles necessary? Oh, <laughs> skittles passes the necessary test too. Uh, funny, funny, funny. I mean, I just set these up randomly, so who knows what was going to happen. But there aren't any counterexamples. There aren't cases of the plants growing without the Skittles, so, so far, so good for Skittles. I mean, probably this is going to get disproven, but there you go. So if we are going to give an answer here, um, actually, let me, uh, here we go. If, um, if I was going to answer this like on the exam, uh, there's, so there's, the exam is actually going to make you do things both ways. It's going to ask you for what passes the NCT in a certain case uh, and what fails. So, uh, and in the homework, you get you get different types of cases. Sometimes they give you these ones that look like case one, and it and it has this stuff going on where it's like, um, right, where it's like uh, A, not B, not C, D and then like G, right? Um, it has these A, B, C, D, G things, and it tells you that the target is G, you know, and then you're testing A, B, C, and D as, as candidates. So you're going to get problems like that, and I'll ask you um, what, for what fails the SCT and what fails the NCT when you're doing these. I'm actually going to give you a problem that looks like this, a word problem. There's a couple of these on the homework to practice too. And in this one, I'll ask you for what passes. So if this was really like the exam, let's do it the way I would do it on the exam. I'd be asking for what um, passes the SCT and then what uh, passes the NCT. So you'd have to do both for me. And um, let's make, just make a simple line here. So you could maybe, you could put your answer just like a list. It would be really totally cool with me. So going back here, 
what do we say, passes the SCT. None of them pass the SCT, right? Yeah. They all fail. There's at least one counterexample for all of them. So you would just write none. <laughs> that would be your answer. And that's, a, that's an answer. Maybe nothing passes. Passes the NCT. We had a bunch of them, right? Um, fertilizer passed, sunlight passed, and Skittles. So I'd put fertilizer, sunlight, ooh, and Skittles. Yeah. So that could be that could be what your answer looks like. The other way I'm asking you to do some with these A B C D G problems, um, I'll ask you to actually let's just do an A B C D G problem, and I'll show you how this works with the fail. Just to give you an example of what these would look like. Uh, so let me pull that up. All right, here we go. Here's uh, scans of the homework, the PDF of the scans of the homework I've got here. So um, I'd actually want this to look. Uh, we should probably do it like this, huh? Yeah. Um, I'd want this to look like this. So I'll ask you for what fails the SCT, um, and then what fails the NCT, like this. That's how I'm going to do it. So um, let's do number one here. So we're just doing number one. Uh, what fails the SCT? Well, remember, the SCT counterexample is a case where the candidate is present, but the target is not. Um, so if A, B, C, and D are our candidate features, and G is the target, and again, that's important to remember. It's, it might even be helpful to write this down. If you're like, target is G, candidates are A, B, C, D. It's important to remember this because you have to test each individual claim. So let's see, does A pass? Yes, because there's never a case of A present and G not present. So A is fine, so we just would omit it here. You would, it didn't fail. Okay. Does B? Yep, B fails. B fails in case two because here's a case where B is present and G is not. Okay, remember that's a logical symbol for not. C passes. We don't get any counterexamples with C, so we'll leave it. Uh, oh, but D fails. D fails in case two. Same thing, right? D is present, G is not. All right, so that failed SCT. Now let's do NCT. Remember, again, counterexamples are going to be cases where the target is present, but the candidate is not. So where G is present, but, um, you know, A, B, C, or D is not present. And that's not happening with A. A is passing both of them because um, there isn't the case of G present, A not present. B fails again. And this time it fails in case three. Um, case three it fails in because here's a case where B wasn't present but G is. C is passing, so it's doing good. And hey, D D is they're just symmetrical here. Failed in case three. Now in this problem, this would be the correct answer for problem number one. So I just did some of your homework for you. You're welcome. Um, but it's possible that you could have multiple failures. Like take number two here. Uh, D fails the NCT for G in cases 1 and 3, because those are both counterexamples to the NCT. So I'd want you to write that. If that if you're doing that, you'd be like D, and you'd say case uh, cases 1 and 3. I'd want to know I want to know all the counterexamples on the exam when I'm asking for this, and on the homework too. Okay, so if there's more than one counterexample, give me all of them. All right, so hopefully that gives you some examples uh, and it explains all the concepts and you can kind of see this at work. You, these are the two types of problems you're going to get. You're going to get A, B, C, D, G problems on the exam and you're also going to get this kind of word problem thing. Um, I really think it is helpful to uh, sort everything out um, using, oops, using um, this little chart as a reminder uh, because um, it's easy to mix up SCT and NCT and to forget what you're looking for. And what you're looking for is a counterexample to disprove it, for it to fail the test. Uh, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't fail, then that suggests it might be a sufficient or necessary condition. But again, not 100% proof. Okay, um, that's it for this video. Um, let me know if you got any questions. Anything else I can explain some more? Come to the study session um, and. Yeah, good luck. Well, I'm going to keep trying to churn these things out. Uh, we've got probably two more to do. Um, and I think one will be short and one will be longer. Uh, inference the best explanation is going to take a while. Uh, argument from analogy is a little shorter. Um, so I think it'll be a short one and a long one. And I don't know which one I'll do first. But well, we'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling tomorrow. Um, so I'll see you later.